Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, if you've got your sword with you tonight, we don't want you to leave it in the sheath. We want you to pull it out, sharpen it tonight. Amen. This is sword maintenance. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you, how many of y'all have knives in your kitchen? I was down at Sam's Club the other day, and there was a guy on a, a pedestal in the middle of Sam's Club, and he had a microphone like mine, and he was saying, everybody gather around for a demonstration of the most incredible knives that you've ever seen. And I walked up to the thing, and I looked, and I went, oh, I know those knives. My wife bought those from you last year when you were here. And he got these knives out. And I'm telling you, this guy started slicing and dicing and chopping. And I'm telling you, he could take and he could shave just these little tiny slivers. And he's, you know, this knife is just unbelievable. I want you to realize something. Stainless steel is stainless steel. I don't care if you call it a Ginsu knife. I don't care what you call it. Now, there are different grades of steel, but there's a, a steel that we call a surgical grade steel. And these knives, they were saying, these knives are just, and, and that guy would sit there and slice these little thin, he had a kiwi. And he was slicing this kiwi so thin. And I said, you know, I can go take you to my kitchen right now and get that same knife out that you sold my wife last year. And you try to slice that kiwi, and you're going to have a mess on the floor to pick up. Because it's going to go boom. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because it was a defective knife? No. Because that knife has to be maintained. The edge on that knife. And it really isn't the knife. It's a factory edge. Now, I've spent the last many years <laughs> trying to find a knife sharpener that would restore a knife to the factory edge. I even went, the last one I bought, I spent almost $100 on it. And I thought, all I have to do is get a good enough knife sharpener and I'll get that factory edge. And I bought this thing at Bed and Bath and Beyond. Almost $100. And I came home and I, I did my knife sharpening thing on that thing and it still was not a factory edge. Amen? And you know, in our lives... When we're living daily, we're like that knife blade. And we're being used. Well, a knife will stay sharp forever if you leave it in a drawer. But we're out here being used every day. I mean, people, I, I hear Christians say all the time, I, I don't even want to go to church. They just use me there. Well, well didn't you pray God use me? <laughs> well, I just feel used. What would you rather feel? Unused? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm here to be used. I'm here to say, Father, use me to do your will with your people on earth as it is in heaven. Did anyone else come with that attitude? Use me. And now when I'm getting used, I get dull. I, get, I, I have to be maintained. I have to be sharpened. And the Bible says iron sharpens iron. And, you know, you can put an edge on a knife with a stone, but then the, the professional guys, they use what's called a butcher's steel. And I got two or three of them in my drawer. I'm still trying to figure out how to use one after 50 years. And sometimes it's almost by accident. I get that perfect angle and that perfect number of strokes, and I get that knife like razor sharp. And then I just want to say, Kyung, don't use that knife. Because I want it to stay that way. And you know, there are times we come in here and we get filled with the Spirit and we get a revelation of the Word of God and we're just like, don't touch us. Don't anybody speak to me. I don't want to lose this moment. But then somebody, and then you'll always have that person. And you'll walk in the kitchen and they've got your good knife. And they're like hacking on a chicken bone with it, you know? And you're like, no, I spent an hour trying to get that thing sharp. And then sometimes we have that abuse in the church. Well, there's a cleaver in my drawer. There's two kinds of cleavers. There's a light cleaver. And then there's a, I mean, this sucker will fight, take your hand off, you know what I mean? You miss, you're missing a hand. It's a heavy-weighted cleaver. 
And, and you know, there are different knives for different jobs. And we all have different gifts for different jobs in the church. And when you go in, I bet you, how many of y'all have more than one knife in your kitchen? I got drawers full of them. I got, I got wood blocks full of them. I even have a plastic container full of steak knives. On steak knife, steak night, we get the steak knife. Huh? We have butter knives. They don't need to be sharp. Why? They're just for doing butter. We have all these different gifts. Amen? Now, 2 Timothy is where we've been working. We've been calling this message Training Day. And last week we, we were working this and I called it Recognizing and Releasing Your Gifts. And some of y'all, you know, you're still in the, in the block. And you're a beautiful knife. Look at the handle on that knife. You walk by. That's a beautiful knife. Have you seen my knife? Wow, that's a nice knife, Dave. I got a friend up in Toronto, Canada, and he's one of the best knife sharpeners I know, Frank Sebersing. The guy, in fact, when he comes to our house to visit, my wife's like, Frank, kitchen, sharpen my knives. And the guy can just, he'll take that butcher steel and he'll just, and he looks like he's just beating the knife. But when he's done, it's got a razor edge on it. And I'm like, can you just move in? Just stay here with me because my knives are going to get used and abused. Hmm? But he's got that honed skill, man. He can just and do that. But he'll come to our house, you know. And I went to his house one time. And uh, when uh, we were at his house, he, he was asking me. He's got some uh, physical disabilities, you know. He's, he's blind. And he was asking for some help with some things. And I'm like, where are your tools at? And he, he took me down into his basement to his tool room. And his tool room was beautiful. And there was every kind of tool that you could imagine. And they were all in boxes. And most of them had never been opened. And I said, Frank... You got all these tools and they've never been used. And he said, well, I don't let nobody use my tools. I just like tools, but I don't want anybody to use them because I want them to stay new. That's what he said to me. <laughs> now, those are a couple of really good parables about the church and the gifts of God in you. Some of you still in the box. Some of you still in the chopping block. And some of you need good sharpening because you've been used and abused. Amen. All different kinds of people here. All different kinds of gifts. We have power saws. We have reciprocating saws. We have circular saws. We have jigsaws. We have cordless drills. We have hammer drills. We have drills that are designed to go through concrete. When we have drills that are designed to bore big holes through wood for electrical. They call them uh, uh, lag bits, you know. These big old shipman's augers, they call them, auger bits. And they're designed to bore big holes through. All different kinds of tools and all different kinds of things for building. Now, which tool is the most important tool in the shed? The one you need right now. You can have the most incredible circular saw on planet Earth. And you can show me and say, Dave, this saw is awesome. I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but right now I need a jigsaw. i got to cut out a countertop, and I need a jigsaw. Well, can't you use my circular saw? No, it don't fit here. And you know, I've never seen a circular saw in Home Depot when I'm walking through the, the, the aisle. I've never seen a circular saw just get up and walk over and jump in the jigsaw slot. Have you? It's just content to be a jigsaw. Why? It knows what it was made for. And each one of you have been designed for a purpose. And here's the thing. Your life on planet earth is only practice for planet heaven. Amen. Now let me ask you something. You know, most of you, if you're an adult in here and the kids are, most of the kids are gone, most of you have jobs. Correct? I mean, you work for machine works, machine communications. 
you know. Bill works for the battery company. You make batteries or distribute batteries. And I need some nine volts. <laughs> Vic's retired. He was an insulator. Amen? Everybody works different jobs in here. And as everybody's working different jobs, you have different purposes. And each one of you. But guess what? When you get to planet heaven... Guess what? Your company ain't going to be there. Amen. You know that? And here's what we strive to do in the church. We strive to say, everything you build on earth is temporary. But everything, you know, and I'm talking about things. Whatever you make on planet earth is temporary. Whatever you make for planet heaven is eternal. So, if I go out here and I make a car... That's temporal. But if I, through a gift in me, help develop you, that's eternal. Amen. My car that I made won't go to heaven with me. You will. Amen. The things that we invest in. The Bible says this. If you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, you reap of the Spirit eternal life. Agree? Amen. So what does that mean? Now, when I used to read that, I used to think, well, that means if you do evil things, you know, you're going to get evil things. And if you do good things, you're going to get good things. And one day I was reading that, and the Lord said, you need to go back and read that again and understand what it means. To sow to the flesh is not evil. You've been sown to the flesh all day long. How many of y'all ate today? Did you get up and get dressed? What happened to the shower water that came out of the faucet to clean your nasty self up? Where did it go? To the water treatment plant. Or would you say corruption? Everything you sow to the flesh leads to corruption. What happened to the toothpaste you used to brush those old snags today? What happened to it? You spit it out. It went to the wastewater treatment plant. And eventually into the high river, you know. Then back to you, right? <laughs> You're drinking what you spit out last week. But um, thank God they're downriver, right? But there's somebody upriver from us. You're drinking Marietta's toothpaste. Just kidding. <laughs> think about it. Recycling. When I was a little kid, we went to the wastewater treatment plant in Jackson, Ohio on a field trip. And we were like in like fifth grade. And they took us all through and showed us those big round vats where all the solids settled and the bugs ate the solids. And then the, the, the water went from here to here to here. And then they took us down to Salt Creek. And there was a pipe that ran down to Salt Creek, and water came out of the pipe and went into Salt Creek. And I'll never forget the guy that was giving us the tour. He had a glass, and he walked over, and he, he said, Now this water has been through the wastewater treatment plant. It is as pure as any water that comes out of your tap. And he held the glass, and he filled the glass up. He said, Who would like to take a drink? And all of us said, I ain't drinking that. I don't care what you say. I'll die before I'll take a drink of that. Because we'd seen the process. Amen? <laughs> so we all got this, this purpose. We've all got this design in God. Everything that we sow to of the flesh. How many of y'all bought clothes? You buy clothes. Where are the clothes you bought five years ago? They're in one of two places. <laughs> They're in the closet where you're believing God they'll fit again one day. Where you've got your, you know, I'll wear those jeans again in Jesus' name, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Or you've wore them out and they've went into the dump. They're in the landfill. What you sow, anything you sow to the flesh. You know, I remember when the iPad came out. It was awesome until the iPad 2 come out. And it was awesome until the iPad 3 came out. And it was awesome until the iPad Air came out. 
and I'm a sucker for what's next. How about you? We're on iPhone 5S now. Six is coming out in a couple of months. I'll have one. Why, I'm a sucker to sow to the flesh. Amen. What's wrong with the iPhone 5? Nothing. Then why are you buying an iPhone 6? Because it's there. Right? It tempted me. <laughs> it put a craving on me when it showed me something my other one wouldn't do. It created discontent in me. So what I'm telling you is everything in life that has to do with the flesh, it's not wrong. It's life. You have to have things. You have to eat. You have to sleep. You have to drink. You have to take care of business. You have to work. You have to provide for your family. That's all real and that's all material and it's all okay. But don't neglect the weightier matter. What have you sown to the Spirit? We know what you've sown to the flesh. People sow to the flesh every day, all day long. I sowed to my flesh all day long. But I also, beginning with my waking breath, took time in my day, my precious golden moments, and I said, I know everything I do today is going in the trash tomorrow. Everything I eat, I'm sending an offering down to the wastewater treatment plant in a couple hours. Amen. Everything I eat is going. Everything I drink. I spend a lot of time eating. You say, we'd have never known. Amen. It's called the role of the ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. I spend time preparing food. I spend time planning my meals. And guess what I'm going to get from it? I'm going to get another day of living in my flesh. I'm going to get corruption because it's all going to nothing. But what happens when I pray? That's eternal. If I pray and I touch a heart, if I pray and I fill a cup of, the Bible says, prayers of the saints are incense that's being offered before God's throne. If I truly believe that, the day, the mo I spent you know, a little over an hour this morning praying. That hour is eternal. When I, when I get to planet heaven, my hour will produce for eternity for me. Eternal relationships. Eternal human beings that I touched. Because I stood in the gap and I made up the hedge of protection. And I believed God. When I'm in heaven and I'm talking to the people I prayed for this morning, which was some of you, I don't have time to pray specifically for every single person in the realm of my influence every day. So what I do is I pray for my immediate uh, family, I pray for the church government, and then I ask the Holy Spirit, bring people to my mind that need intercession today. And it's amazing how faces and will just start popping in front of me. Lord, help that person today. Oh, Jesus, I know they're going through a rough time today. Father, I pray you strengthen them. I pray you encourage them. That's eternal. What about time sharpening my sword? See, that's using my sword. Prayer. Witnessing. Every time I take a few extra minutes to have a conversation that I really don't have time to have. That's eternal. Every time I stretch out a little bit to fellowship with another believer to bring encouragement and, and to help them live in the peace of life. That's eternal. That's using your knife. Every time I preach and teach and prepare to preach and teach, I'm, you know, now i got to sharpen my knife. Because if, if, you know, a good chef, if you watch those chef shows, a good chef, they sharpen their knife every time they use it. They don't let it get to where you got to hack through a stalk of celery. They sense the least bit of too much resistance. They whip out that butcher steel. Ching, 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 ching. And then they slice right on through. And the Bible says where the axe is dull, it requires much strength. And so therein we get the old saying, work smarter, not harder. Sharpen your axe and you use less strength. If we'll stay sharp in the spirit... If we'll stay with an edge on us in the spirit every day, taking that time to be sharpened. 
Some of y'all, man, you like my knives in the kitchen. You've been used and abused, but you got to come back. And you got to allow the master to daily lay you on that steel and bring you back to a razor edge. Amen. Amen. I love that scripture where God said to Israel, I'll make you a sharp threshing instrument with new teeth. Amen. Nothing like it. Anything used must be sharpened. And you're no different. And the scripture tells us, therefore, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, or I'm sorry, we're going to go on down 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you. If a full-time minister, Timothy was the pastor at the church of Ephesus, sat in as the senior leader of a city by the apostle Paul. And if Paul had to tell him to stir up the gift that was in him, how much more do we need to encourage one another daily when we're out here making cars or selling cars or fixing cars? When we're out here drilling for oil or selling the oil or leasing the oil. Well, how much more do we have to be sharpened by the anointing and by the Spirit of God? Daily we must come and have our mercy renewed. Amen. You deal with people long enough and you'll realize what those scriptures mean when it says, My mercies are new every morning. Amen. And ours have to be too. I mean, there are very few days I don't have to go back for a drink of mercy. Why? I'm tapped. Amen. Lord, I just used up my last drop of mercy. Let me fill up again. Mm. Let me tell you, the secret to the mercy drink. Are you ready? The secret to the mercy drink. It, it's the most effective tool I have ever seen. The secret... To the mercy drink. I'm going to show it to you. I keep it with me all the time. Are you ready? This is, this is very important. Here's the secret to the mercy drink. Huh? Huh? Isn't it? Here's the secret, guys. You say, how do I put up these fools? Look in the mirror. Huh? There's the secret to the mercy drink right there. Every morning I get up and I look in the mirror and I remember what I've been forgiven for and of. I remember what, you know, what I was and what I could be again. I remember whose I am and whose I'm not. Every day, and it, over for these guys over here in case you didn't catch it, it's the mirror app. And every day I look in the mirror and I say, how can I have mercy on these fools? These fools I work with, these fools I sometimes go to church with, how can I have mercy on these idiots, these morons? I just look in the mirror Amen. and I say, <laughs> yeah, I'm still a pretty foolish thing and I still need mercy. So as long as I'm getting mercy, I'm given mercy. As long as mercy's covering me today, and then I'm not going to make the mistake of comparing myself among my, ourselves. Remember when Paul said, comparing yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. In other words, you start thinking, well, you, you know, I only need an ounce of mercy today and you need like a ton. No, no, no. How many sins does it take to send you to hell? So who wants to be like the leanest sinner that ever went to hell? So therefore we have mercy given to us every day and freely we've received, so freely we give. You know, one of the most unused knives in the church today is mercy. And you know who uses it the least? The ones who have it. Why? You can't use it if you ain't got it. You're in the house, and the Bible says, he who shows mercy, we looked at this the other day, with cheerfulness. 
Why are you so sad? Because of all the wrong going on in the world. Well, that's why you've got to say, I can make a difference. One gesture at a time. Nobody wants, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be the cop that walked out on the ledge to talk down the jumper, talked to him for an hour, and they both jumped. Amen. You've got to have some cheerfulness in you when you show the gift of mercy. You've got to be able to encourage, amen, when you show the gift of mercy. Because I'm telling you, sometimes you listen to someone's story and, and they're hopeless. Their faith has been wounded. They're in despair, but you're not. And so you're there to make up the hedge. You're there to seal up that gaping hole in their heart where they've been in a wound, they've been in a battle wound, and you're there to ply the compress. You're there to put the pressure on them and bandage the wound. And so now it's your hope they'll have to ride on for a few minutes. You might be giving them a transfusion of living blood. Amen. They may need your blood to survive the day. And that's where you say, come on, man, it's going to be all right. God is with you. God's going to bring you through this. One day you'll look back on this. You know, I remember one day I, I, I was talking to Pastor Bob and he was, he was encouraging me as he's done over the years. He's been such an encouragement in my life. And there's been lots of days I call him discouraged as a pastor. And he'd say, well, Dave, I remember one day I called him and I was so discouraged because we had a low turnout. And I said, Pastor Bob, man, the church had split. We went from running, you know, almost 200 people to running like 100 and sometimes 75. And I was like, I called him, I said, Pastor Bob, we only had 60 people there tonight. And you know what he said to me? Praise the Lord, son. How many did you have when you started? Amen. And I said, 12. He said, what an increase. <laughs> what an increase. Don't worry, son. God's got a lot of souls he needs you to shepherd out there. They'll find you, and you'll find them. Just be patient. Sometimes people just make mistakes. And that's how he talked to me. And I'd say, oh, no, I know. And I'd get up and preach again. Hallelujah. It was a gift of mercy, the gift of encouragement. One of the most powerful gifts in the church. Why? Because we're in battle. You know, in the field, you're not, you're not supposed to, according to the Geneva Convention, you're not allowed to shoot a medic, and you're not allowed to shoot down a medical helicopter. They have a big red cross on them. And according to the Geneva Convention, you're not allowed to shoot them guys. Now, unfortunately, there are some evil people that will even shoot the mercy folks. But I see a lot of times over the years in the church... The mercy gifts that are supposed to be giving mercy, sometimes if they're not careful, they catch offenses of people they're supposed to be ministering to, and they both jump. I would have encouraged this guy not to leave the church, and we left. We both left. You missed the point. You weren't going over there to join in discouragement. You were going over there to offer encouragement. Amen. Amen. Mercy people, arise. Be the, the bandages of God. Sometimes mercy is the, you're, the, you're that kit hanging on the wall. You don't feel very important until someone needs you. You know, you, you may just sit on the wall in the airport for years and then all of a sudden somebody drops and you're the most important tool in the room. Defib, you know, clear. You just saved a life. Some of you are God's paddles. And you've got to recognize when those people drop and you say cardiac arrest, check, defib. Poof. I mean, there are different kinds of gifts. Just like there are different kinds of knives and different kinds of drills and different kinds of saws. We're building the house of God. Amen. When I need a plumber, when my toilet backs up, I don't call the electrician. I don't call the roofer. I call the plumber. People come to me and say, man, Brother Dave, I need deliverance. I say, see, Jenkins. Why? Because he's got a team of guys around him and they minister deliverance. 
I don't have time to cast out every devil in every church. I don't have time. So I say, let's get the tool, and I become the general contractor. I'm not the roofer. I schedule the roofer. I'm not the plumber. I schedule the plumber. I keep the job running smoothly. I'm headquarters, so to speak. I'm sitting here going, okay, we need something over here. We need something over here. You know, one of the most beautiful pictures of this happened this past weekend. I did what I do. I made a spontaneous decision. Spontaneous decisions have consequences. The larger the organization, the greater the consequences. And so I I was sitting in the office. I said, Dennis, man, I'm really feeling in the spirit. You know, we need to have a fellowship. We haven't done it in several months. And I said, we need to pull the body in together. And I said, you know, Labor Day weekend is is a weekend of people coming together. And fellowship. I said, let's do a Saturday night service and let's just do a fellowship. This is like, you know, six days before. And we got to feed 300 people. And Dennis says, uh, okay, all right. And so I'm like, cool. The visionary has done his job. I've cast the vision. Oh, we're going to have cornhole, and we're going to have food, and we'll put the tables out in the parking lot, and we'll set some speakers out. I did my part. And uh, Saturday morning, I woke up, and I felt panic come on me. And I went, oh, crap. That's tonight. And I've done nothing. And so I picked up the phone early Saturday morning. I called Dennis. I said, dude, what do we need for tonight? And these were the words that came back. It's all covered, Pastor. I said, it's all covered. What about covered? 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 He said, it's all covered. I said, really? (laughs) You mean that's, it worked? It worked? My God, it worked? (laughs) So I came to play Cornell. Hallelujah. It was awesome. Because there were some gifts and, and, and one gift jumped up and said, I can do that. Another gift jumped up and said, I can do that. We need food. George Welsh jumped up. I can smoke a pig. We're going to sanctify the swine this weekend. We're going to have a move of God on the spit. And man, he brought the swine. Come on, somebody. I didn't eat him, but he brought it. <laughs> it was good. I could smell it. And it put a craving on me. And then, you know, somebody else jumped up and said, well, I can take care of that part. I can take care of that part. We got people organizing, setting things in order. We, I mean, the thing is, it was just like, we had, and this is what was said, we had more food. We had more food than we've ever had in any fellowship. And we had so much food. People were going through the line three and four times. And they had so much good, wholesome food. I'm evangelistically speaking. But it was good. And it was a great time and a great fellowship. And there was a great spirit. And people received encouragement. And people received fellowship. And it was awesome. And so I applaud you who became a part of that, whether it was a part of organizing something or just bringing a a move of God in a dish. I mean, we had some, I'm telling you, to put on that spread, we had some women who touched heaven in their kitchen. I ate some stuff that was like, this is a move of God in tinfoil. It was good. It was awesome. And then I came in Sunday morning. And Dennis said, every children's church worker called off. I went, <laughs> it didn't all work Sunday morning. And so we had people scrambling. We got 125 kids coming. And every worker called off at the last minute. Thank God some other gifts said, I got your back. And we picked up the slack. And we had... A children's ministry Sunday morning, impromptu. 
But I just want you to know, when you make a commitment, I expect you to keep it. Now, there are times you can't. I understand that. There are emergencies. I understand that. But let's make sure that's a real emergency and not just a convenience. Let's just make sure someone didn't give you a better offer that was more pleasing to your flesh. You know what I mean? Let's keep our commitments and let's be faithful in our commitments. So we still hit and miss, and that's why the mercy people come in. We got this. We got it. We're covered. I said, thank God. Then it said, man, some of our teens stepped up to the plate, and everything just went fine. I said, hallelujah. Thank God for the team B. When team A doesn't play, we got a backup team. Amen. Thank God for that. But we need faithful people in every area of ministry. We need faithful worshipers and faithful ushers and greeters. Can I remind you to stir up the gift that is within you? Because it's there. It's there. Last week I mentioned this and it bears mentioning again. Rewards are not based on your gift. You say, well, Pastor Dave, you got a, a gift that's more out there than mine. It doesn't matter. I have the same reward you do. It doesn't matter if you got the gift of bringing water to a guest speaker or if you are the guest speaker. The gift's the same. In fact, the Bible says the guy that gives the water to the speaker gets the speaker's reward. Amen. You ever read that? Amen. Did you think Jesus is lying? You think his, his watching us use our gifts every time we walk in this house is not real? You think there aren't records being kept of your stewardship of your gift? You think he hadn't marked every time you take the extra moment to encourage someone who's discouraged? To help someone who needs help? To pray for someone that needs prayer? To teach a kid that needs taught? To pull people together when they need to pull, be pulled together? To run a vacuum when it needs to be run? And empty a trash can when it needs to be emptied? You think he don't keep good records? You better believe he does because you don't get rewarded for your gift. I, I don't get any greater reward for what I'm doing than the least, what would be called least of the gifts in this house. Amen. Some people say, well, you're the most important gift. My gift has a greater responsibility, but my gift has no greater reward. The only thing that designs our reward is the stewardship of our gift. Are we faithful with our gift? That's what brings rewards, not the gift. Why? It wouldn't be fair. A gift is a gift. I, I shouldn't get anything more of a reward than you do. Why? I didn't choose my gift. My gift chose me. Amen. I didn't walk up to God and say, I'll tell you what, I want to be an apostle with a prophetic teaching anointing that births churches. Never happened. He, my gift chose me. Your gift chose you. Our rewards, some of you are thinking, well, that ain't very important. No. Let me correct you. Every part of the body is important. Amen. Some of you are thinking, well, I won't have as much in heaven as you got. Oh, no, 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 no. We won't be rewarded for the gift. We'll be rewarded for the stewardship of the gift. Remember the parables Jesus taught. It was the faithfulness that he rewarded. Well done, good and faithful servant. The man that was given one talent didn't lose his reward because it was only one. He lost his reward because he was a bad steward of the one he had. Amen. That's why the one that had ten was given more. So it, it comes back to how we use it. I mean, guys, I truly believe the words when Jesus said, Truly, verily, I say unto you, if you give a cup of water to a prophet in the name of a prophet, or just in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward? Jesus can't lie. Don't you think what you do is insignificant? Don't you think what you do is not going to be rewarded? And I'm still a creature who is motivated by reward. 
People say, were you just doing this because you love Jesus? Yes, and because I know I've got a reward for being faithful. I know I'm going to spend eternity in planet heaven. I'm not going to spend eternity without having everything like I'm stacking the deck in my favor. I get to choose by my faithfulness how I spend eternity. My faithfulness to building the house of God determines my position for eternity. This, if you will, is a trial run to see how you'll work out in heaven. Let me, let me explain it this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in planet heaven. Because heaven isn't clouds. Heaven is a place. That's why I like to call it planet heaven. It's a place. It has dimensions. It even gives the dimensions in the book of Revelation. The holy city, New Jerusalem, which is the bride created for the Lamb. Where we will spend eternity and we will be the tabernacle of God. Where he will dwell with us and we will dwell with him. In an eternal friendship family. It's an awesome thing. All we do now, guys, is determining our eternal positioning when we forgive and how we forgive, if we forgive, that's the greatest, let me say it this way, the greatest test of stewardship is forgiveness. What do you do with it? Freely, God forgave you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That means we have to release forgiveness even before people repent at times. Now, is God still going to demand repentance out of them? Yes, but not on you. Amen. That's on them. That's not on you. You forgive. When you forgive, for is a prefix. It means you give something before something. Amen. God forgave you while we were yet sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. When we acknowledge our transgression, he released that forgiveness towards us. Well, some people say, well, now the scripture says that if he repents, forgive him. And there is a place and a time governmentally where God says, as a steward of my forgiveness, governmentally in the church, you at times are called to hold people from fellowship until there's repentance. That's church government. In my personal life, I say, Father, I forgive them. I don't hold nothing against nobody. I don't care what they did, what they said, where they went. I, I release everybody from everything. Lord, as far as it's concerned, concerning anything done against me, I ask you, Father, to forgive them for it. That's what I pray. Amen. That's the greatest stewardship there is. Why? Because it's the one gift that God told us in our stewardship. If we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. And there's no greater penalty. That one carries the ultimate. If we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. So we got to remember these things. Being stewards. Serving grace, leading grace. I was talking to Kevin Leal one day and he said this to me. He said, David, let me ask you a question. What's the most important Support function in a skyscraper. And I said, the foundation. He said, nope. I said, what? I don't understand. He said, the elevator. A skyscraper without an elevator is useless. It could stand there for eternity, but nobody can use it. Why, ain't nobody going to climb 100 flight of stairs to get to their office? Ain't nobody going to climb up 200 stories to get to their apartment? That elevator is a support tool. 
And it's hidden in the middle and no one even really thinks about it. Let it break. Let it break. Let the, the cleaning staff go on strike here. Let, let the ushers just say, you know what, we ain't doing this no more. And you'll find out these support ministries, you'll find out just how important they are. Let the children's workers do like they did Sunday, just not come. Service after service. And see what happens to the kids running around here. And you're trying to hear the word and you're wrestling a two-year-old. Because you know a two-year-old, to try to wrestle a two-year-old through a a 40-minute message. I'm just checking. I don't want to be lying to Jesus here tonight. I'm at 38 minutes. Hallelujah. Got two minutes. Oh, well, that see, that's not my fault. My watch is wrong. In closing. That's mercy and grace. Amen. But as we close tonight, I want to remind you. In your gift support, you're important. Some of you, you know, there's leaders of 10, leaders of 50, leaders of 100, leaders of 1,000, leaders of 5,000, leaders of 10,000, leaders of 100,000. They're grace gifts. You didn't earn them. You didn't choose them. They chose you. What part of a whole does your gift support? What part of the whole does your gift support? When does your gift begin to manifest? When you begin to move. Do you know that almost everything I've said here tonight was not preconceived? The whole first 20 minutes of this message were spontaneous. I had no pre, pre, when I stepped up on this platform, knife sharpening tools was nowhere in me. It was nowhere in me. That illustration came instantaneously when I opened my mouth. It's just like a GPS. When does it start talking? When you start driving. Some of y'all say, why ain't God talking to me? Because you ain't doing nothing. Start driving and the GPS will start talking and there will be times she'll say, Recalculating, recalculating, make U turn at next, you know, recalculating. Remember, your gift's gonna start talking to you when you begin to do things. Don't let your gift be ideal, make it real. Don't, don't let your gift get lost in the world of ideal, make it real. Last thing, don't, just because you brought the bat, or just because you brought the glove, or just because you bought the catcher's gear, don't try to control the game. It's my bat. We play my way or we don't play. I got the bat. I'm the only bat. You are a bat. (laughs) Amen. You know the old saying, the boy came to play one day and they said game's over he said no it's my bat my ball my daddy's umpire we play till we win <laughs> no 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 when you come to the game you come to play as a team and your part will have a part but your part ain't the whole when you come in here you need to recognize I'm just a part tonight you may have brought the glove the ball the bat the bases Maybe you're the field. Maybe you're the backstop. Maybe you're an outfielder. Maybe you're the person cheering the team on. But you have a part. What good is baseball if there's no crowd? Hmm? What if tonight God just called you here to cheer me on? Hey, I'm encouraged. I'd been flat discouraged if you wouldn't have come. (laughs) Amen. I mean, my wife would have been graceful enough to listen, but thank you, Jesus. Father, tonight we stir the gifts that are within us. Like iron sharpening iron, I pray that each gift in this house would sharpen and encourage one another. Like like that tool that's being used for the purpose it was designed. 
Lord, let each person in this house know tonight when their gift is needed, they're the most important gift in the room. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to just lay your hands on your belly for a minute. And I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about your gift. What is your gift? Is it prophecy? Is it teaching? Exhortation? Mercy? Is it leading? Administration? What is your gift? What's your motivational gift? What are your spiritual gifts? Tongues? Interpretation of tongues? How important is that gift? Well, we can't use tongues without it. Prophecy. Gifts of healing. Working of miracles. Gifts of faith. Where you can believe for some people sometimes. It's a gift of faith. Discerning of spirits. Words of wisdom. Words of knowledge. Where you just know that you can help this person because you just feel inside. You know what they can do. They're in a situation and you've got an answer. I had a man come to me one day and he had a 357 in his mouth the night before. He was getting ready to blow his head off because he was going into a million dollar bankruptcy. And I sit and listen to him talk for a few minutes and I just had a word of knowledge and I said, have you ever thought about this or this or this and couldn't you do this? And he looked at me and goes, I don't know, I never thought of that. I said, let's go try. And we got in a car and we drove two and a half hours. And we drove two and a half hours and we walked into a man's business and, and we sat down and the guy looked at the other guy and said, I'm going bankrupt and they're repossessing my equipment. But I bought some equipment from you and I'm trying to protect myself and my family. And the guy said, I'll buy your equipment. And he bought all of his equipment. And in two and a half hours, he was delivered of a well over a million dollar bankruptcy. Because I just said, well, let's go up and ask the guy. That was a word of knowledge. It's a word of knowledge. It sure beat a 357. And humiliation, losing his home and everything. He was back in business in a couple of months. Hallelujah. And you never know when God will just give you that little nudge for someone. Use your gifts. Use your gifts. And you mercy people, get with the program, man. We got a lot of hurting folks. Don't sit around and wait for someone else to do it. If you see the need, meet the need. Because you see through your gift. Anytime you walk in a church and you say, they need more of, you just identified yourself. Well, I'll tell you, this church needs more love. You just identified yourself. You're supposed to be the love supplier in that church. Why are you complaining about what everybody else is not doing when you're supposed to be doing it? Amen. Stir up the gift that's within you. Your gift is calling. Amen. Your gift is calling. Hallelujah. Can I get my prayer team up here? This is a gift that God uses every time we assemble to help people. It's a gift God uses every time we assemble to encourage people. You say, well, didn't you come up last week? Hey, you keep coming until you get your answer. They've all been told, you don't, you know, you don't get, you don't, you don't stop praying for people. We keep believing God. I've been through my seasons of hell on earth. Some folks are going through theirs. The person you keep praying for week after week, one day may be up here praying for you when you're going through your season of life because we're going to go through some tough seasons. Amen? 
Hallelujah. Jesus, we worship you. Stand with me tonight. As we close, we'd just love you to come and get prayer if you need prayer. Love for you to continue to be faithful in what God's calling you to do. Remember, you're sowing to the Spirit and you're going to reap eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, come and get prayer. Otherwise, you are dismissed. We love you and bless you. In Jesus' name.